Morning, everybody. I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope you had a restful holiday. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, welcome to meeting one of the Infrastructure Environment Committee. Welcome to members of the committee, to other members of council, and of course to members of the public, and of course our supporting city staff. For those of you in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are on the agenda and what's coming up next. And you can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at toronto.ca backslash council. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Are there any declarations under the uh, declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? None. Uh, we do have some speakers for today. Uh, we'll run through the list, and of course, we're going to review the agenda now. First item, uh, we will obviously hold. We're going to elect a vice chair shortly, uh, but if we can go to item 1.2, contract award, detailed design services during construction, post construction for the Fairbank. Silverthorn Storm Trunk Sewer System request for proposal. Can I have uh, someone move the item? Unless someone wants to hold it. Councillor Layton, you're. If, if I could just hold, I, I have just one question on it, so it won't take long. Okay, that item is held. Item three, non-competitive contract with Zimmer Air Service for control of European gypsy moth outbreak in 2019. Um, I'll, I have a question about that one too, please. You're gonna hold that one too? Yes, please, sorry, Gosh. James. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, it won't take long though. Promise? Yeah. Uh, item four, Metrolink Eglinton Crosstown Light Rail Transit traffic regulation amendments, new traffic signals, and long-term road closures. I'll hold that. And we're holding for speakers, <coughs> and of course, uh, uh, Councillor Cole wants to uh, have items related to that as well. Item number five, uh, we do have speakers, so we'll hold that item uh, as well. So election of the Vice Chair for Infrastructure Environment Committee, are there any nominations for Vice Chair of the Infrastructure Environment Committee? Councillor Menawang. Councillor McKelvey. Okay. Do you accept the nomination? Yes. You do? Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? As there are no further nominations, the nominations are now closed. Uh, so since uh, Councillor McKelvey is the only nomination, I declare Councillor McKelvey elected as Vice Chair of the Infrastructure Environment Committee for the term of office starting today and ending December 31st, 2020 until his successor is appointed. Congratulations, Councillor McKelvey. Congratulations. Where do we point it? I have to make a speech now. Yeah. Okay. Tell us your priorities for the term. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Layton, you held item two down, contract award. You had uh, one short question sure, for yes, staff. Yes, thank you very much. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the three, three oh short questions with I, four parts each. Oh my gosh. But there, I'm not trying to rush What's it. the typical number that the city normally, uh, that, that contracts over a certain number go to council? And why isn't this going to council? Uh, through the chair, under the purchasing bylaw, uh, Contract awards over 20 million go to standing committee. Uh, they would go to council if the if it was funded from an operating budget and it was longer than five years, or there was a budget issue that would require uh, a council approve the budget as well. But most uh, awards 
uh, go to the standing committee or are done at the bid award panel. And so the original cost estimates were how much for the project? Uh, through, through the chair, the original, uh, when we completed the original environmental assessment, was it the total for the area was in the order of $84 million. Uh, so there has been an increase, obviously, in terms of the, the, the numbers. The cost estimate now, all told, all in, is, is over $180 million. It's a far more complex project than what was envisioned through the environmental assessment. Uh, it's complicated by virtue of a very long tunnel, uh, uh, two and a half kilometers, four meter diameter. Uh, there's complications with respect to upsizing and, and uh, improving the local servicing, i.e. local sewers in the area. So it's, it's a far more complex project than what was envisioned in the original environmental assessment. And what's the, what's the cost increase of the design work? Uh, uh, through the chair, typically the design work is usually a percentage of the actual construction fees, and so that really hasn't hasn't changed um, as percentage-wise. Um, it, percentage-wise, it's in the order of about 16% all in with the design as well as the contract administration, and it's, and it's within typical market rates. So, so the issuance was for the design and construction? Uh, correct, and post-construction. And post-construction. And what, what's included in the post-construction? Uh, uh, through the chair, typically to address any warranty issues that may arise uh, through the warranty period and um, ensuring that the contractor then does uh, rectify, and so all of that is done in accordance with our original requirements. So which company did the environmental assessment originally? Uh, through the chair, uh, it was the same company that we are recommending award of the design work, uh, CH2 on Hill. So, we had a company conduct an EA and they came up with a number which then doubled at their design stage. Uh, through the chair, uh, we had a company that undertook the EA with staff. Uh, we then hired another engineering firm that did the pre-design work. That company is Hatchmont McDonald. And so at this stage with the completed pre-design work where we've uh, uh, we've made some, some changes to the alignment of the tunnel to minimize property impacts. The original EA with its proposed alignment uh, would have encumbered a number of sites where the city would have had to, uh, uh, to purchase. Uh, the new alignment is, 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 uh, minimizes uh, property impacts as well as a much deeper tunnel than what was originally proposed in the environmental assessment. So, so wait a second, when was it decided to minimize the property impacts and who made that decision? Well, through the chair, as we went through the pre-design work, our intention was, as you get into the pre-design work, you're looking at details and looking at minimizing overall impacts. Um, you know, it's just a part of the uh, part of the process in undertaking uh, uh, the the design work. It's all, always our objective is to minimize impacts. So, the the company that's being awarded the contract completed the environmental assessment, but they didn't do the pre-design, um, the the pre-design work that would have been the in the content of the request for proposal that we're awarding, correct? There was an intermediary. They didn't, they didn't see every stage of this. Through the through. chair, exactly. Okay. And what I, I need to emphasize is the fact that we actually had a peer review of the pre-design work. And again, um, our interest was, given the cost escalations and, and given the changes to the work, is ensuring that at the end of the day, we have a, a tunnel system, an integrated system that actually provides the function and, and the servicing that was originally expected. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll move the staff recommendation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Thank you for your uh, financial oversight. Um, when I was your age, this was a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, any other questions for staff? Speakers? <coughs> the recommendations are being moved by Count Councillor Layton. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Councillor Layton, you also held uh, the next item. Thank you very much. And, and these, this is more of, I, I don't suspect anyone's here from public health. Because I, I just have some concern. It's, this is aerial spraying, correct? Through the chair, yes, this is aerial spraying. And and what are the like? Are there health impacts? Have we evaluated the health impacts of aerial spraying on people and and animals? Through the chair, absolutely. We've been, we've consulted with public health. Okay. This isn't the first year we've done this. We've done it in 2008, uh, 2013. 
Uh, it's it's in normally it's in conjunction with other municipalities. Okay. So, yeah, there's been a lot of research done. No no public health issues. Um, is there going to be like I would just be ready for calls, like seriously, be ready for people calling in saying something's being sprayed on my on my house because they're they'll be coming. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Any other questions for staff? Gypsy Moth Spring. So, um, for wards 1, 2, 3, 4, 11, 12, and 15. Uh, I guess the balance of the wards have to buy mothballs or? Yes, I'm sorry, Councillor Layton, you were going to speak? Just going to move the staff recommendations. Staff recommendations. I'll include a mothball uh, amendment if. That's the All right, so uh, the staff recommendations are being moved. All those in favor? Opposed? That is, that is carried. Next item is uh, Metrolinks, Eglinton Crosstown, Light Rail Transit, traffic regulation amendments, new traffic signals, and long-term road closures. Bill Henry, thank you very much for Coming to City Hall, you're very brave. You have five minutes. My name is Bill Henry, President and Project Director of Crosslinks Transit Solutions. Chair Pasternak and committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the Crosstown report that is before you. Although the Crosstown is a provincial project, the City of Toronto plays a significant role in enabling the timely construction Several of the items you are being asked to approve are intended to do just that. Last night, Metrolinks and Crosslinks held a town hall consultation of the Crosslinks plan for the Forest Hill Station, where we told the community we would not be pursuing the temporary closure of Bathurst Street, north of Eglinton. We will continue to follow the original plan Therefore, the recommendations in Section 10 and 11 are no longer required. Crosslinks has withdrawn the application for the permit for the closure. Crosslinks fully supports the recommendations included in the report you are considering today. Building a new transit system through a build-up urban area is challenging. We all know that. That's why Crosslinks, Metrolinks, and City Transportation staff have carefully considered the items you are being asked to approve today to make sure they are absolutely necessary and they are the least disruptive options. Several of the measures you are being asked to approve are necessary to keep construction moving on time and on budget. I'm not going to get into the details of the technical aspects of what's in the report. Those issues will be addressed by Transportation Services staff and my staff who are here today. My key message today is how critically important it is for Crosslinks to have a collaborative re relationship with the City of Toronto to successfully deliver this project. What I mean by success is not only delivering on time and on budget, but by delivering a new transit system that has the full support of the City and the residents who are going to use it and benefit from it. Crosslinks has monthly meetings with Eglinton councillors and city staff from a number of divisions, as well as monthly con construction liaison committee meetings with business and resident representatives. The initiatives set out in the report are communicated and discussed at those meetings. Residents and businesses around our construction sites are provided with advance notice before the work takes place. Some councillors have expressed an interest in being more engaged in the project. We welcome that and are happy to establish another forum we can communicate with councillors and constructively address issues so that we stay on schedule and deliver this project September 2021. In 2019, you are really going to be able to see the progress we are making on Crosstown. And most of the deep underground station sites, by the end of the year, we will be out of the roadway and conditions will be getting back to normal as our work moves off road and underground. On the east side of the alignment, we will start seeing track installed as well as overhead line equipment. 
Crosslinks looks forward to continuing to work with the city of Toronto. Thank you, and I'm happy to take on any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Questions for the deputant, Councillor Cole. Residents of Midtown, and uh, I thank uh, them for uh, appreciating uh, the uh, angst and the uh, real uh, frustration uh, many have uh, felt. But at least last night at the meeting, uh, there was an, a, a very good uh, forum to uh, essentially engage and share some of the mutual, uh, let's say, challenges that uh, Crosslinks faces and uh, uh, the people face. I just want to ask a question. If you could explain to people just briefly, uh, what is, uh, what's Crosslink's relationship with Metrolinx? What, you can explain the difference between the two. Right. Uh, we're, the, we're contracted by Metrolinx to deliver the project. So we're responsible, Crosslink's transit solution, I'm responsible for the design, the construction, and the commissioning of the line for revenue service. Okay, so the tunneling work you were not involved uh, in the tunneling work, uh, which uh, is basically, uh, for the most part, complete right now. Yeah. No. And there are trains running underneath uh, as we speak. Are there not work trains that are running? Where they will be running. But I'm saying there are the work trains that are uh, uh, underneath. Correct. correct. So you weren't involved in that, but you've been involved more directly in the station construction. Station construction, and then through the tunnels, really doing all the fit out. So what we do is we put in the main base, all of the rail, all of the uh, system components within that tunnel. We did not do the tunnel boring or any of the, the tunneling aspects. So in, in terms of the, um, the, the one thing that uh, I guess frustrated people here is what precipitated this urgency to uh, put forward this uh, plan to uh, have this closure of Bathurst at Eglinton uh, for the seven month period. Could you just explain the background to that? The background of that was uh, early in May, or actually earlier in the first and second quarter of 2018. We were looking at ways to optimize and deliver the works faster and trying to get, quite frankly, off the street quicker uh, for, for traffic. Uh, why do we want to do that? Is to create greater float. These are big, big system projects and things can go wrong and we want to have enough flow to cover things that may go wrong, the unforeseen, the unknown unknowns as we uh, deliver this project. But that said, on, on uh, Bathurst, uh, for the Forest Hill Station, we're continuing on as we talked about last night with our, con our current plan uh, to achieve what we need to achieve. Yeah, and then the other uh, thing you mentioned is the uh the beginning of uh, resurfacing uh, Eglinton, bringing it back to some form of normalcy, when will that begin? It's anticipated the end of February. So then people will start to see the uh, that's removal. Eglinton, that's Eglinton Young. So if we look at the stages, we were primarily most of the deep underground stations, as we discussed last night, we're trying to get to a point where you see us off the road, you'll see Still construction, but it'll be more of a normal condo type development, people accessing uh, the particular stations. But we wanna get off the road, as we talked last night at, at Bathurst and Eglinton, we wanna get that back to two lanes by the end of this year. So, uh, and you've been involved in this type of uh, mega project f uh, in many venues. Is this the, one of the most complex uh, projects you've been involved in? It's very complex. So my background, uh, I was in the United Kingdom. I was asked to come to the United Kingdom in 2002. Uh, we rejuvenated uh, Great Britain's railway, the main spine West Coast route modernization. That was from London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, all the way to Glasgow. Made it high speed. Uh, did a lot of that work. Great Western as well from Paddington out to Wales. And then uh, most recently, before I arrived here, I did the Riyadh Metro on the American Consortium side, which was a 10 billion job, right in the heart of Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is a very difficult job. So you're putting a new transit system into a live operating city. 
uh, it is as difficult of a project that uh, any of those are that I just mentioned. So it, I guess it's similar to the Riyad, but I guess Riyad doesn't have the urban density that the Eglinton Corridor has, does it? I would say it's even more dense. Really? Yes. Well, I've never if been it, to Riyadh. So. Riyadh is a, is a major uh, city, six million as a population. It is dense. Roadways are much wider. Uh, and uh, so we had a little more space. Here, the space is very tight, very congested. And so the north-south lines, the university line, the young line, uh, that, those Answer. interface. Answer, Cole. Oh, yeah, okay. Last okay. question. Unless. Anyway, that, that's fine. Uh, thank you, uh, thank Mr. You, Henry. Cool. All right. Any other questions for the deputy and Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of road closures here, and I'm sure that there, there are many within our communities and our, and, and and, and councillors across the city with, with some concerns. Um, can you give us an idea of what kind of delays we could expect to the project delivery if we didn't allow for some of these closures? Like, are there some that are more critical than others? Are there, are, are we looking at days, weeks, months, years behind if, if we're not moving ahead with these? Well, let's talk about the east side of the alignment. The east side of the alignment on, on part of the, what the paper is before you is absolutely critical. We need to start taking the guideway, okay, which is the center section of uh, Eglinton, to start putting in our system, quite frankly, and that's uh, that's really our big focus right now. There could be significant delays if we do not get uh, the what's asked for in the paper before you, minus the section 10 and section 11 that we. Mm -hmm. What what's the significant delay? Well, Give us an idea. Shock us. Uh, we don't get shocked easily here. Yeah. So <clears throat> it could be, and again, we did, we'd have to look at this, and our plans are built around uh, what's before you right now to achieve minus section 10 and 11 we talked about last night, which is a bathroom's closure. There will be delays. And, and there's always ways you can work around it. What we basically need in this program is the, is the space to deliver this infrastructure. And that's what that paper requires. So what do we need? We need the center of the east side of that alignment to be able to start putting the guideway in, quite frankly. It's as simple as that. So we need the space to do that. You can start seeing and uh, uh, what we have going on. You see a lot of pylons and I know that Tracy sees it as she drives through into work, but uh, it's this we need. It's it's a work front. It's a critical work front. And and the west side we're underground. Just about finishing that off, as I said before, by the end of this year we'll be underground. You won't see us. By the way, there is currently a lot of work going on under that underground. We have 112 kilometers of track that's already installed. We have a tremendous amount within the tunnels, tremendous amount of uh, system work being cables, being uh, conduits and, and the like, and overhead line equipment for the electrification of the system. We need to do the same thing on the east side. And that's the focus right now. That's what this paper supports. And so we want to work collaboratively with you to enable us to do that. Uh, it's vital. It's critical. If you look at the big scheme of things, we have 33 months to go to put people up riding on this great system that we're bringing to the city. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you, uh, Council Council Leader. Councilor Perusa. I love the project. I, I like, I'm one of the, the big supporters of the project. Truth is, you don't care about road closures. If you, if you could, let, let me just rephrase that. That didn't sound like if a you could, If you could shut it all down and create as much space for your construction activity as you could, you would. If we were, if we were allowed to do that, absolutely. Okay, exactly. So meaning, if we, let's say in a, in a, in a different world, and we were able to do that for you, 
how many more men and machines would you bring to the project and how much quicker would you deliver it? Truth is, zero. You would do exactly the same thing you're doing now. Is that I, I kind of answered the question for you, but yeah. you're, you're, I, I, I'd be happy if you contradicted it and said yeah, something I different. I will, because sure. at, right now we have 2,600 people working on the alignment. We anticipate that plan to increase up to about 3,700 people. Okay? So as much workspace as we can move on to, we will put people and equipment to do that work. My objective is to create as much float, bring things back to the left of the program as we can, so we have what we call in this industry certainty of delivery of making the date that we have committed to folks. No, no, I, I, I understand you, you're committed to a, a particular uh, timetable, you're committed to, to delivering the project, you're committed to keeping the people that you hire working, and all of the things that you do. But the truth is, that's the plan. You, you essentially have nothing more. A, and B, you just like to occupy as much space as possible uh, for your men to be able to do that. And I'll tell you why I say you that. I experienced it firsthand at the corner of Keelan Finch with the subway construction. Not much different than what you're doing on Eglinton. Uh, you know, the contractor came in and said, oh, we need this lane closed because we're doing, gonna do this work, it's gonna be for three weeks. Truth is, they shut down the lane. They shut it down for months and months and months. All they did was park some bullards there, some concrete things, a couple of machines. Never, and I had an office there, never ever saw any men working in, on that site. Truth is, they just wanted the space. They wanted the sort of, to be able to roam around their construction site. That's what you do, because you want that comfort. I get that, I've done construction work. I get that, and, and the reality is, as long as you get that, you don't care about road closures because you're just focused in on, your, on, on the work uh, for, for, your, for your folks. And no, uh, That's the reality, right? Councillor Perza, thank you for the rhetorical no, 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 questions. But, but, but this is important. No, these, it's this very, is, very important because they hold us ransom. They hold the people of the city ransom when they do these projects. They, they shut speech. down roads. We can they, go to they, they basically kill businesses in an area. They don't care. Yeah. Councillor Perza, this is questions for the deputant. Well, that's my question. Well, it sounded more You rhetorical. don't care. No, do you do. care? Yes, we do. There you go. Now we've got that. Okay? Yes, we do okay. care. <laughs> and it's no different. Now, let me speak for a minute. Sure, please. I think it's important. I was, I was trying to, able to deliver. fire you up to do that. I led major projects in the United Kingdom. You can look them, look them up on Google. And, and we did it successfully. We brought the city and the communities and the areas in which we did so. We couldn't have done it without their help. Okay? And that's what this is gonna take. It's gonna take the will of the city, it's gonna take the will of the people to help us get this in the next 33 months. And I can assure you I do care, because I care about the safe passage of people to enable them to go to work. We all have to go to work, we have to do our jobs, we have to take our people, our children to school. We do care about that. And that's one of the fundamental things that in the projects that I led in the United Kingdom, and in Saudi Arabia, we we're able to do, okay? And I intend to do that here. There's certain laws that we have to abide by. There's agreements we have to abide by to enable two things to happen. One is the delivery of the infrastructure project, this great system, I think is world-class. I kind of like Tracy, I wish we had the east side underground, but we don't, okay? And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, you have my commitment to make sure that when we do have the space where we can do work, we will be working. We don't have that option of not working in a space that we need to be working at. We have 33 months to go, okay? And that's five, uh, that's five minutes, Councilor Perza. Councilor Minnewong? I'm gonna maybe ask the questions, answer them in here. Um, so, so Crosslinks is a consortium of all the construction companies, yes? Uh, of the four cons four partners. Yeah, so you're a private yeah. sector company. Yeah. You're representing yes. all the private sector companies. So Metrolinx is the government body. You're not the government body. You're the right. private sector company. So, so you know, Councilor Prutz has suggested that, you know, you want this to get done as fast as possible. So for no, every... No, I didn't say that. Fair enough. They do not want to get it done as fast as possible. Well, let me ask you this question. No, they, they got the cow. They want to milk the cow. They want to milk the cow a long time. 
All right. I don't understand um. that, but well, I don't fences and cows and stuff, but I do have a question about your project. Your, the, the contract that was awarded to you, is it, a is it at a fixed rate, yes? Yes. So every day, every day that you can, f that you finish early is more money in the pockets of the consortium, is that correct? Oh, we have a plan, we have a commitment. To no, 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 sorry. Oh, wait, we have a contract that has us completing and putting a revenue service September 29, 2021. Yeah. That's our commitment to do that. And if you- and Our commitment, we have, it's, we need this to finish on time. So my question, if you finish, is there any financial reward to the consortium or any of the companies if they s finish no. faster? No. That's right. No. Sorry. <laughs> he answered it. I, I oh, feel huh. like I have Shelly Carroll sitting next to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, <coughs> so, so you don't, so if you finish like 10 days early, that means that there's 10 days less you have to pay your workers, 10 days less you have to rent the equipment. You don't, those companies don't realize that financial reward? Well, in, in, in any business, in the private sector we would, we are on tight on schedule or tight on budget. No, no, but can you answer my question? If you finish 10 days early, less uh, work for construction workers, you don't have to pay them and you don't have to pay for all the equipment. Right. That means there's more money for you, is that right? That's an opportunity, yes. More money, I think, I'll yeah. take that. And then if you finish late, there are um, financial penalties, yes? So to so the idea of you're, you're kind of, you need to finish on time, and if you don't finish on time, there's gonna be consequences for your, for all these companies, so therefore, you're trying to get all these road closures for many different reasons, but one of them is, is, is there's a financial incentive involved in that. Is, that. is that unreasonable? I think it is unreasonable. I think it is unreasonable on this standpoint. We have a budget, we have a schedule. Our schedule is September 2021, okay? We have to have, things can go awry in a mega project that nobody in this room can perceive. See unknown unknowns that happen. You've been in construction, you would know it well. And, and that's what we have to make sure that we are able to deliver with this project in a timely fashion that assures revenue service September 29, 2021. Okay, uh, just a different question. It's not, it is this, is there a contingency in the contracts that were awarded? All projects have contingency. And what, what's the contingency in this contract? Oh, it's a private number. Oh. I'm not gonna disclose it. I see. All right, I'll find that someplace else. Thank you, you. Um, Councillor uh, Minner Wong. Anyone else? I just have a couple of quick questions, um, if nobody else does. And Councillor Bridges, I know you have more to add to the conversation. Could you include it in, when we go to speakers? Sure. Could you include your... your I know you want to add more to the conversation. Could you include that when we go to speakers? I have a whole lot to add to the conversation. Okay. Well, you can, have, you can have the full five minutes. <laughs> I wanted to do that in, uh, partly in, uh, in fine, sure. So, um, based on your comments, I jotted down 2022 as operational and ready for the public. Is that? 2000, September 2021. September 29th, 2021. 2021. That's okay. Our, that's our milestone. And currently at Bathurst and Eglinton, there's turn restrictions. Do you still need those turn restrictions? I'll let uh, Ron or this. Why you? This. Morning, uh, through the chair. My name is Ron Stewart. I'm dealing with traffic management issues for crosslinks. With the uh, with the construction schedule for this year. As, as stated, the, uh, uh, it is planned that the intersection will be returned to virtually what we would call normal conditions before the project, end of this year, and at that point, you would not need the turn restrictions that are currently in place at Bathurst and Eglinton. So do you need anything from this committee to, to remove those turn restrictions? I see there's a series of motions affecting them based on closure, which is now not taking place. So the, the, uh, 
The ban of turns, the prohibition of turns has been in place as part of the construction management for several years. So there's no need at this point to deal with anything to do with turn restrictions at that intersection. Okay, and they come off when? So the, the, construct, the, the site will be returned to normal traffic operations December 2019. Okay, uh, just a question for General Manager Transportation. Uh, normally when we have uh, street festivals or, or marathons or other kind of street events, there's cl road closure fees, including fees to the TTC for rerouting buses. Does Metrolinx or its subcontractors pay those fees to the city? for this project? Uh, yes, Chair, they do. They do. Okay, thank you very much. It, they may not be the same schedule of fees as for short-term closures for events. It's a different situation. But they would pay the same way a charity would pay or a culture there, There's a There's a contract that's been developed. I don't want to call it a contract, but there's a, an agreement that's been developed about fees, yes. Okay, fair enough. Let's go to speakers. Um, sorry? Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. No more questions for the deputant? I sort of jumped the gun by asking a question of staff, but we, we can go to questions for staff now. Yeah. Councillor Minnawong, Councillor Cole, questions for staff? Actually, it's 4A at Sloan Avenue. You're removing the right turn lane? Through the chair, uh, yes. Uh, okay, so why are you doing that? Sorry, uh, you got to speak up. Sorry, I can't hear you. Just to ensure there's a safety of traffic movements at the intersection and there are lesser conflicts. Is that a problem now? That will be when uh, Crosslinks goes there uh, to do the construction. So th with the staging in place, uh, we want to make sure that there are no conflicts. So there aren't any con I, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm confused. You're taking out a right turn lane, which means that that's going to bung up traffic on Eglinton because people are going to queue up because pe people that are wanting to turn right onto Sloan Avenue, we're gonna have to wait for all those people that are gonna turn right um, when it's green or, right? So, but the, the staff member hasn't really sort of suggested to me any reason why I shouldn't keep them in. I, I mean, there's just, I'm looking for a reason why they have, why they can't stay in, because people like to switch into that right turn lane if, if they wanna get out of the, the main traffic lanes and they, they, they've already cut down by putting in the um, uh, by putting in by putting in the LRT. They've already taken a lane out, and now they want to take out the right turn lane, which means traffic's going to be even worse. I'm I'm going to I I'm not disposed towards supporting that unless someone can tell me exactly why that's absolutely needed. Is that how's that? Through the chair, um, you know this is this is part of the permanent design that will be implemented and uh, approved through the EA as well, EA for the project. Um, you know we want to make sure that the traffic movements are maintained, so the right turn movement will be shared with the through movements at this intersection. It's protected okay, so right now, and it's going to be right again, through. Well, I haven't gotten this satisfactory answer, so I'll just. Um, Make a right turn. Want to take it offline or move to delete? What do you want? Well, to do? No, I, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, secondly, so the second one is um, the. So you're removing the west left turn at the intersection of Ellington Avenue and Victoria Park, which I'm not so much opposed to. Um, but I need to be satisfied that people can will still be able to turn left at O'Connor Drive and Victoria Park. 
through the chair. So the, as I understand it, these two turn restrictions are part of the permanent project? Sorry, can we focus um, the answer on answering my question, Mr. Chair? Can, so if you're traveling along Eglinton, Eglinton's a, a you know, important street, Arterial Road. Victoria Park is also an important street, it's Arterial Road. So you're saying that the people that are going westbound can't turn left and go south, which is a big, you know, inconvenience. Like how do people get get turning south, right? But there is a, a, way, f a way that you can do it if you curve down O'Connor Drive, which is a, just a little cut through. I just want to be satisfied that you can make that left turn on O'Connor, which most people can do. Therefore, that would allow for the removal of the left turn prohibition because people wouldn't be too, they wouldn't hardly be in convenience at all. They really wouldn't notice. I just want to make sure that you can still make the left at O'Connor Drive. Easy. The common sense this is a fairly practical question for people that are traveling from Scarborough and need to go south. Through you, Chair, we're just consulting the map just so we make sure we give you the BCM right answer. Our act, our, Staff understand this because staff lives in the air. She's <laughs> nodding her head. Yeah, I'm driving the route while you're talking. Yeah. There's no indication of closure. Through you, yeah, that, that left turn will be available. That, that left turn is not being restricted. Um, okay. Um, great. Those were my questions. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Menawang. Councillor McAlvey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions. The first is, once this is implemented, what is the monitoring, and if there is a problem that's identified, a problem intersection, what is the way to amend this, um, and what's the rooting for that decision-making? Through you, Chair, so the, um, the authority to do those road closures that we're seeking today from this committee and council because it's beyond the 365 days of approval. Um, those permits are able to be uh, revisited if there are issues or modifications that need to happen to them. That they're not working, we would go back and have the conversation with Crosslinks about the impacts uh, and make modifications. That's my understanding. And the second question is, it's a little bit tangential, but also a little related. Um, there's the the congestion management plan that as I was recently made aware of, and that that should be coming every six months. So I'm just wondering when that's coming back. And uh, also, how does that relate to these sorts of closures, or is that incorporated in it, or is it just a, that plan just related to timing of lights and things like that, and is it adapted with these infrastructure changes? Through you, the congestion management plan is a five-year plan. We're actually coming back with an update to the original five-year plan towards the end of this year. It does cover all congestion-related issues, not just signal timing, um, including issues around closures and modifications or mitigations that we could make related to that. Um, and uh, we come back uh, with, an, with a semi-annual report, which we are hoping to push out uh, publicly you know, within the six-month time frame. So uh, probably before June, we'll come back. I, I don't know that we'll come back to committee. We will come back with an update on the accomplishments of the report. We will have an issue, an update on the accomplishments of the report. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Any other questions for staff? No? Oh, Councillor Cole. It would really be helpful. So we're not uh, just signaling with our hands. And uh, I know being Italian, we're used to that. But mm. we need perhaps some modern digital technology up here from the 1950s to take a look at the, the roads and that. Uh, I, I just have a few questions. I think the, the, the root of this issue, and I know a lot of it, uh, the venom has been uh, spewed towards uh, Metrolinks and Crosslinks. No, no, I'm just asking a question. So uh, the question I have of our staff is, what's the process for notifying the local councillor that you're going to have a seven-month road closure? Why weren't we notified that this was, in essence, being worked on by city staff and that, in fact, city staff was 
in agreement that this should proceed, why weren't the, why weren't the local councillors informed? Through you, Chair, our, um, our authority is at a, as a permitting entity is we work um, in support of the city's goals, but also in, to get the project completed, and so we work in partnership. Uh, I think this issue was problematic because of the timing. Um, this came to our attention in terms of looking at issues and mitigations related to the proposal that Crosslinks had put forward uh, in about the end of October. Uh, the council had not reconstituted at that part and Crosslinks had started reaching out. Um, we were asking Crosslinks to come back with um, studies to look at what the impacts were on infiltration, what the impacts would be related to TTC routes, et cetera. And as soon as council came back in December was when we, we connected back with the council. Um, and I think the, learn, the lesson learned moving forward for us is that we will continue to have more robust sessions in advance with all the councilors along the alignment um, you know, before we have our monthly sit downs with, uh, with Crosslinks and Metrolink so that we can make sure everybody is apprised of the issues early and that there are no surprises. And how come there were public notifications, thousands of them uh, issued throughout the middle of Toronto saying that the road was going to be closed and yet staff did not inform the local councillors that uh, city staff was basically working alongside this uh, concept of closing off, again, the middle of the city for seven months. Why wasn't there even a phone call to a local councillor saying that this decision had been made? Through you, so, uh, so Crosslinks' project and their public notification uh, is, is the schedule, they keep that schedule. Uh, my understanding is that they uh, did their best to reach out during, again, the time after the election and before the council had seated. Um, and there was some uh, preliminary conversations, but as we got more information from them uh, about the impacts, we, we brought those forward to the council as soon as they were, uh, as soon as you all were back in your offices again after the election. Um, the timing of the outreach to the public is, is typical timing as I understand it for how uh, Crosslinks and Metrolinks has worked to to provide notification. Uh, they wanted to give the community uh, enough notification uh, if they thought that the project was gonna move forward as they had proposed it. And, uh, and there was certainly more uh, analysis that was required and more communication that was needed with the community, which is, I believe, why we came, uh, why this, the proposal that was removed was removed eventually. Is it possible to have a protocol put in place that before there's a significant road closure, which this was for seven months, that part of the procedures your staff, uh, transportation staff, undertakes is to call, talk to, meet with the councillor before there's any kind of agreement or any kind of uh, uh, coalescence with the city staff, with Metrolinx, that it be imperative that a call be made to the councillor before you're about to issue a permit. Because frankly, the permit was about to be issued. We just caught it the last minute, uh, you know, the, thanks to the mayor's office, or else they would have got the permit because the councillors weren't even told about it. Through you, the, the city was not going to issue the permit until they had uh, adequate consultation and uh, notification. And, uh, and the timing of it, I think, was unfortunate given that there was lots going on before the holidays. Um, we do, the city, my staff has uh, had monthly meetings with councillors along the alignment to ensure that there's updated information. This committee sees these closure proposals when they're a year in advance. Um, and I think we have nothing, we, we certainly have more opportunities to increase that communication uh, and continue to work with uh, Crosslinks and Metrolinx on communication with the public along the alignment. And, as thank you. you, no, uh, you one last question. You're over oh, five minutes. Okay, sorry. I, I, think, I think it's the point's been made and I think the answers have been made and let's consider it a teaching moment and we're gonna do better. Any other questions for staff? I guess we can go to speakers. Who would like to speak? I'll speak. Um, Councillor Minowong. Yeah, I, I have a couple of things I want to talk about. Firstly, um, I'm going to move to delete 4A, westbound right turn lane at the intersection of Legnan East and Sloan Avenue. They want to take that out. I want to delete that. I'm not satisfied. 
I mean, the, st the answer I got was not a satisfactory answer of why it, that's necessary. So I'm prepared to look at that if, if staff can talk to me later and just tell me why that's the case. What we do know for sure is the traffic, first of all, what we do know for sure is traffic is horrible on Anglinton. Right now it's horrible. If, if you're coming from Scarborough and going to the Don Valley Parkway, it's like I've never seen it so bad to the extent that you're getting more traffic on Lawrence. Um, the executive director knows that because she lives it every day because she lives up in that neighborhood. Sorry, Tracy. Um, and you also see, um, uh, you know, I take with a grain of salt the idea of cut through traffic coming through neighborhoods sometimes, but for sure people are going through local neighborhoods to try and scooch through because the traffic's so bad. When the, when, the, when the LRT does go in, traffic is going it's, to, it's not going to completely relent because you've already taken out a lane of traffic, right? And it's a busy street. So the idea of taking out a right turn, um, uh, dedicated right turn lane that's supposed to actually make traffic move faster doesn't really appeal to me and I'm not satisfied that I want to support that. Um, I will say that, I mean, I watched uh, Councillor Cole's struggles with his particular issue with this um, Metrolinks and Crosslinks with interest um, to the extent that um, I have a lot of sympathy for him. I know when, when uh, uh, Crosslinks came through my neighbourhood, um, they weren't terribly facilitative. They, they make all the, the noises and they make all the right moves for consultation, but they don't it's like they're just doing it because they're checking a box. You ask material questions. They come to the meetings with very nice pictures about what's going to be built, but when you ask them about the problems that are the, the issues, I asked a fundamental question. What's the delay going to be on the line once your construction begins? And they said, why do you want to know that? And I said to them, well, that's because the number one, that's the number one issue. What's, how's people's lives going to be affected by the work you're going to do? They didn't have an answer. And then the other thing is, when you ask them about something and you drill down at the end of the day, they're not prepared to actually, most of the time, make any changes. Because they know what they want to do and they're going to do it and they're not going to listen. Um, I learned from Councillor Cole's, the previous Councillor Cole and from Councillor Burnside, I had, I've got a lesson from both of them. when Because I went to them when there were going to be uh, traffic restrictions and construction coming into my neighborhood because Burn Councillor Burnside and Councillor Cole had it in their neighbourhood. They warned me. They warned me that, that there, there are going to be difficulties. So I think that um, from what I hear is Councillor Cole is getting a, 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 a good outcome. Um, and I'm pleased about that. But I think that um, it's taken a lot of work on his part. And uh, um, I think that uh, Crosslinks hopefully has taken a lesson from this, that they not only have to have the consultations, consultation means listening and doing something about it. And hopefully they've got, they've learned from this experience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilman Wong. Uh, Councilman Layton, please. Thank you very much. And, and I won't claim to understand this intersection better than, than most in the room, um, but I, in, in, from what I heard from staff and in just confirmation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase it as a question. Um, were you aware that the, the removal of the westbound right uh, the westbound right turn was part of the permanent design and if you deleted this you would have to make a decision about which through lane would be lost because you would lose a through lane of traffic so i'm deleting this now mr chair with the with the so to meet with staff after this um, because any we still this still has to be approved by council and so i'm happy to sit down with staff and if if there are proper arguments that are made i'm happy to Put that back in. Okay. I, I just I'll, the only I'll add one thing. I mean, I I asked the question here, and I didn't get the proper response. I said, "Why are you doing this? What's going on?" And they didn't give me the answer, and that's why I'm moving for this deletion. Um, and I need to sit down with them to work this through to find out if there's uh, if there's a an answer to this. But if 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 it's absolutely necessary and, and I can find out what the delays and the impacts are going to be, I'm happy to bring it back and add it back in. That was questions for the mover, not speakers. Okay. Uh, speakers? Councillor Cole? And then Councillor Layton. I have my motion, but I I wish to move. You want me to read it, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, if you could. 
Uh, item uh, 1E 1.4, Metrolink's Eglinton Crosstown Light Rail Transit, Traffic Regulation Amendments, New Traffic Signals and Long-Term Road Closures, Wards 5, 8, 12, 16, 20, 21. Uh, that the infra I move that the Infrastructure Environment Committee remove recommendations number 10 and 11 from item 1E 1.4. Those are the uh, references uh, that the uh, deputant, Mr. Henry, made about the uh, seven month closure of uh, Bather Street at Eglinton uh, to uh, north-south traffic. So that uh, would not take place and they would uh, return to uh, the uh, previously uh, agreed to schedule uh, for the foreseeable future. So this would uh, facilitate that uh, continuing. Okay, uh, okay uh, you're done? Okay, thank, no, no, you. Can I speak thank you very much. Can I speak to it or? Uh... Oh yeah, no, you're, you do have the floor. Yeah, okay, thank you. Anyways, I just want to say, uh, just to reiterate uh, some of the comments made by Councillor Prutz, uh, Councillor Minamwang. This is not an easy thing by any means. Uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, the Councillor Prutz had talked about the construction of Finch and Keel. Well, in the middle of Eglinton from um, you know, Laird Drive uh, all the way to Keel Street, uh, there's 20 of those things that you had at Finch and Keel going on right now. So as much as uh, we've had a lot of frustration uh, with the uh, construction, the diversion of traffic, the noise, the drilling, uh, the, I mean, I mean this is the largest transit project in North America happening on one of the busiest uh, east-west thoroughfares that cuts through the middle of the city, Eglinton Avenue West, and you've all, uh, uh, been there, or try to avoid Eglinton, but it, this is so. The contractors, uh, who are Crosslinks uh, under the direction of Metrolinks, have been trying to uh, work at this for the last basically eight or nine years, uh, working around the clock. Uh, they are essentially caught in the middle between the need to have the transit line and the need uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the impact on the public. And the impact on the public, uh, as I've mentioned before in council even, is when I hear people talk about, well, I know there's another announcement today about some other line that's a new subway line going the, uh, uh, here in Toronto. It looks very easy on the map to say, oh, we're going to do this line across Eglinton. But then when you start the construction of these underground, because 10.9 kilometers of this 19 kilometer line is a uh, subway for all intents and purposes. It's electric, it's a train, the station. So when you build these projects, the impact on the community is enormous. We've lost 100 stores that have closed down, 100 retail outlets have closed down between Keel and Bathurst. Uh, so not only business, but the infiltration on the side streets, et cetera. So trying to manage this is most, most difficult. So as much as we've had our conflict with Crosslinks and Metrolinks, I also appreciate the reality of what they're dealing with and the impact on our staff trying to manage this, these traffic changes. So that's why I think uh, it's very difficult to make changes on the floor of council. You could, if you and could I wrap up, it's a little over a, five minutes. a better system of dealing with these going forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and. I, I appreciate the, uh, the the answers that we were given today from uh, from the contractor on the site that that any changes will result in significant delays to the project. And uh, with with respect to the motion put forward that by Councillor Min and Wong, I agree. I don't think the answer was satisfactory to to address uh, the concern. Um, but I think I, I won't be supportive of the amendment um, simply because I think it's premature. I think. I think we need an op he needs an opportunity to go and get that satisfactory answer, but I don't think that removing it helps and uh, helps us move forward this process. Given that um, I was just informed within about 10 seconds of seeing the the uh, uh, the, the amendment that in a very satisfactory way that this would impact the permanent design of the project, uh, meaning there is not enough space in the right of way to maintain a right turning lane. Uh, and maintain the through lanes of traffic. Um, I, I don't know this to be true. I haven't gone out there with a measuring stick, but I'm taking staff's advice that that in itself, in that brief exchange, 
uh, convinces me that we probably need to pass 4A. Um, if, if new information comes to light uh, that, that, that the counselor can bring to council that says, uh, that says we don't, don't need to eliminate that lane, I'll eat my hat and, and support it, its removal at that time. Uh, but given uh, the advice that I've just received from staff, uh, I think it's important that, that we support the staff recommendations, um, but keep an open mind to ensuring we get a satisfactory answer to Councilor Min and Wong's questions um, at, uh, at council and, and consider it then. Thank you, uh, Councilor Layton. Any other speakers? Councilor Perusa? I'm not gonna support this and I'll tell you why. Um, I, I support the projects. I support this one, I support Finch, I think they're great projects. Um, what I don't support is giving these folks a blank check on, on, on road closures um, almost indefinitely. Reality is the contractors, the construction guys, don't care about driving businesses down, uh, <coughs> bankruptcies, uh, traffic disruptions, traffic chaos in neighborhoods. They only care about getting their trucks in and their trucks out and parking for their men. That's it. None of the other stuff. They'll shut it all down on you if they could. Metrolinx doesn't care about this stuff. A little bit. But they got a, a built-in business case to fail businesses as part of the project cost. So what? They, they say, yeah, we understand that. It's going to pay for it at the end of the day. Maybe it's our fault. Why? Because we don't build these projects often enough. In, in fairness to them, they don't understand this construction. The projects are way, way too big, and there's no system that they understand for. They understand high-rise, because they do it all the time. They understand they pour a wing, wait for it to cure a little bit, you got one crane, you only need so men, yeah, that's the system, pa, 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 and they, build, and, and they know that it's, it's a period of time. You add another crane, you add more shoring, then you can go a little faster. But that's the system. They understand that. They don't have a system here. So what they want from here is a blank check to say, give, it, give us whatever we want when we want it. Because as, as the gentleman said, it's a project where you got all kinds of unexpected stuff that can happen to you. We got a, we got a deadline, we got a timeline, we're gonna hire, we're gonna bring in at any one time 2,700 people, ramp up to 3,800, they're all subcontractors. They really don't know. They don't know who, when, where, what, and what, and how. They hope for the best. They just got a, an employee base that they need to continue to keep working as part of the project. That's what they understand. I get that. I understand. I I, I understand uh, what you know the, the the limits they work by. But we are the only ones who have a very very small voice between them on these big projects and neighborhoods, communities, businesses, residents. Not that we get to impact them an awful lot, but from time to time, they have to come here and say, right. I want to shut that road down because I need to do this. At least you get to ask the question. Is there a way you can do it differently? I'll give you an example. Bathurst and Eglinton. I used to drive there every morning. They had this little trailer parked in the middle of the street several years ago, construction trailer. Never saw anybody go to it. They probably had some nails, some boots, some, some trench coats, whatever, some construction stuff in that little trailer. I asked some hard questions here one day because I just kept seeing it there and it, and it tied up an entire lane. It forced you to jog around this little trailer. Our transportation staff undertook that and said, you know what, we'll go ask about it. Trailer disappeared. It was a useless little trailer tying up a lane killing a couple of businesses. It was useless. 
they removed it. They opened up that lane. Happened a couple of years ago. I just give you that as an example, because that's what you're faced with. And if you don't have the ability from time to time to ask them those questions when they come here and say, we want to shut those lanes, shut those roads, then they'll basically do what they want, whatever they want, and they just, they, they, they'll want as much space as possible, because that's the way it works. Because they're also learning from these projects how to do them. Could you deliver them faster? Yeah, most of the construction is above ground. If you had enough machines and enough men, and you started from Scarborough and came back the other way, and these guys went Counselor, that way, and in the middle you had Counselor another Perus, if you the could, other way, of course you could do it much, much faster. Councillor Perus, if you could wrap up. It's just, they have a system, I get it. They're, they're learning that system. But we need to, from time to time, have them come here or wherever and say, or to one of your, one of your offices and say, why are you doing that? Why do you need that for? Because I know they did it to me. And they're gonna do it to you over and over again. Just gonna shut it down. They don't care. Uh, okay. Um, Councilor Perth. Not because they don't Thank you very much. care as human beings. It's just they care about getting their work done. Thank you very much um, for that. Uh, any other speakers on the item? I, I'm just going to make a, a very brief comment uh, that um, this construction project, this infrastructure construction project, transit project, is supposed to be a good news story. It is one of the most transformative projects, high-level transit, ever built in this country. And it will be a great benefit to the people who not only, excuse me, guys, excuse me, guys, uh, it'll not only benefit the house owners in the area who live within walking distance of the Eglinton LRT, uh, who will be able to, to get to transit, high-level transit, very easily, but it'll also uh, create quite the uptick in property values when you live uh, close to uh, high-level transit. So to get to this kind of infrastructure, to get to this kind of transit where we're decades behind as far as the city's concerned, there's a price to pay, and it's not just financial. It is noise, it is disruption, it is mess. And that is the price to pay to get to the, that level and to catch up for the years of, of lack of transit building. So let's try and keep it in perspective. It, it is a good news story for the city. When this opens in 2021, it'll be extremely exciting. People along this route will love it. And, and I think at the end of the day, Although businesses have suffered, although there's inconvenience and traffic congestion, and I drive that route uh, many times a month, uh, I realize there's a, there's a price to pay. But at the end of the day, the city will, will benefit greatly from this project. And I don't envy the people over at, um, uh, at uh, Crosslinks. Uh, this, is, this is a major, messy undertaking uh, with thousands of workers and hundreds of pieces of equipment. I'm done. I was saying, Councillor Layton is quite animated about the motion that I moved, and he seems to think that and staff and staff seem to be, well, I, in my opinion, were unprepared to answer the question that I asked, but apparently they have a, they've looked at it. And if they would like, I'd like to, you know, we can settle this now. I, I, I prefer to defer to take that piece off and look at it, but, you know, there seems to be some interest in looking at it now. So if staff can, you know, if we could go back and bring staff on the floor and they can maybe show us the street and why they need to do what they need to do, then I'm happy to deal with it now at committee. Is that... Um, it's it's more of a, a minutia and offline discussion. I'm d I, well, I'm just trying to find in a between. way forward. I'm not trying to be obstructionist. If, if, if I could, if I could move to to vary the come on, help me out, clerks. To okay. vary the order of proceed to vary okay. the procedure bylaw to allow for staff to answer a question regarding. You this. want to go back to questions for staff? P please. Okay. All right. So, uh, Councilor Minter Wong. Um, do they, can, Did so, you want to do it offline, or you want to no, go no, back to? No, no, I just to, want to do it. 
can we do it now? Take a few minutes. It shouldn't be long. Okay. Well, let's they vary. Put the, do they have a picture or diagram or anything? Or I, I'll also say this street there is is a very difficult street. There's been a lot of redesign, and there have been a lot of accidents. There are a lot of trucks involved, and there are a lot of residents involved. It's not an easy street. It's not an easy intersection. Through the chair, so there we do have an on-screen construction diagram that um, Navi, my staff, is going to go over, and, and as I try to describe this, he'll he'll uh, show the counselor. Um, there's two recommendations about closures, uh, restrictions rather, on the right turn. One is a temporary one, and the one Councillor Minawang is describing is the permanent one at 4A, and the the permanent one uh, would uh, because hold of on, hold on. I got three people talking to me right now. Um, because of straight space constraints, Councillor, we would lose a leftbound through lane if we maintained a dedicated rightbound lane. So now you have a rightbound, a right uh, and through, as opposed to a protected right. And and Navi can walk through the diagram there. That's an exceptionally clear diagram. That well, that's the to. that's the reason why uh, I think I, either way we were happy to come with a more clear diagram. That's the construction document. Uh, if, if it would be easier to describe it in, in more full, we're happy to sit down uh, with, a, with a diagram unless Navi can walk through it here. So the current design of the lane, uh, the westbound lane there at that intersection, is there's a left turn lane, and then there are was it two or three lanes and a right turn lane. Is that correct? Go ahead. In the middle with the guideway in the middle. Uh, we, in order to maintain two lanes, through two lanes, you know, there's insufficient space that will be available. That is the reason that r westbound right turn at this intersection is recommended to be deleted. Um, so you're take, so you're leaving the left turn, you're taking out one lane. If there are three lanes there, that should mean that there are two remaining, right? Or are you taking out two lanes? So we're keeping the westbound left turn lane and the right turn, westbound right turn movement will be shared with the through lanes. So the result will be right and through instead of just right. You know, I understand that. So you're, have, you're just going to take, you're just going to have two lanes. There, there are currently, are there currently three lanes there plus the left and right? Are there currently at that intersection? There should, there's a left turn, advanced left, yes? Or there's a left turn lane, yes? Um, I believe so, Councillor, but I need to confirm that. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll just, this direction, this to Tracy, Tracy, or sorry, um, the executive director or acting DCM. No, deputy. It's, it's very difficult to make knowledgeable decisions on things that affect communities if, if when we're asking questions, we're not getting sharp yes, no answers, that's a problem for me. Um, and I think committee members. Um, the other thing is, is, is there space, I'm just trying to look at a solution here, is there space in the median to, to accommodate bumping out, bumping in uh, a right turn um, lane? Like, could you do that? Councilor, the space for the guideway is uh, set, so that so that is that is the space that is available to accommodate the trains, and and have a safety buffer, Sorry. and the in, and the remaining space is distributed among keeping through lanes and also uh, the westbound left turn. So my question is different than the one that he answered, Mr. Chairman. My question is, he said it was set. My question is different. Is there room? Could we consider, the question is, is could we actually solve this problem by building uh, a right turn lane? Is there space in the, um, what do you call it, the right of way to actually build that out? He said it's set, which is, I mean, that's the answer that I always get from, <laughs> from Metrolinx and Crosslinks. It's set, we can't make any changes. But here I have a, a, actually a real problem where I want to actually make traffic run smoother and maybe this is a problem that they haven't encountered and maybe that maybe someone doesn't want to spend the extra money to put the right turn lane in. I, but the, I think it's an interesting question to ask is, could you do it? 
So um, can, I have a little bit more information on the existing configuration that I think would probably be helpful as you asked. So the current configuration is a left turn, two through lanes, and an exclusive right turn lane. Okay. And so when the, the what, what the um, gentleman was talking about related to this being permanent is that as a part of the permanent configuration was defined and approved by council through the EA process originally, right. that when you put in a two lane guide, when you put the two lanes for the guideway, you would not have enough space to retain the existing configuration and the direction from the council at that time was was through and right turn combined with a through lane so that you would you would have the minimal impact you would still have a reconfiguration but you'd have a minimal impact given what the traffic patterns and the traffic studies showed so that was the that was what was confirmed in the EA and that's why this closure uh, implements that so I'm prepared to withdraw my motion but my question still stands is there room in the right of way yeah, to put I would I would suggest the, the, uh, the answer to, the to that is no why? Is because it, there's not physically enough space with the space of the guideway uh, to address the existing configuration. Sorry, this, can you? I'm not familiar with this word guideway. Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's the the term that I've used previously for where the train is going to run, the two the the operations of the track, the trackway, the trackway. The streetcar track. Actually, I like. Yeah. So, so no, but see that that's. Where I put the right turn lane is on, is on the north end of the street. It has nothing to do with the guideway. It would, so people could turn right this way. There's no room in the guideway to actually cut a piece of it here. I don't know what this has to do with the pedestrian. So, um, <laughs> Councillor Minwong, you're over five minutes. Um, all combined, we've probably spent over 10 minutes on this right-hand turn lane. I empathize because I lost right-hand turn lanes in the old Ward 10. It created traffic havoc on Wilson Avenue. It's an important discussion, but it's the type of thing that you sit down with the drawing. I got the drawing right in front of me uh, here. I can't read a thing on it. I can't make head or tail of what's going on here. I would suggest you withdraw the motion I always draw that motion. Sit, sit down with staff between now and council, and if you are unsatisfied with the response you're getting, then bring the motion back at council. The committee should make a site visit. Committee make a site visit? I would put you through that. My gosh. <laughs> you know how long it would take you to get there because of the traffic? <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, just to confirm, Councillor Minowong, you, you are withdrawing your, yep. your motion because we do have to vote on that. Uh, all those in favor of uh, withdrawing, supporting the withdrawal of the motion, opposed, that is carried. Uh, now, we did deviate from normal procedure. Are we ready to vote on this item? So we just have the one motion. We have Councillor Cole's motion, and then we have the item as amended. Okay. So uh, Councillor Cole is moving that we're deleting recommendations 10 and 11. All those in favor? Oh, that's unanimous. And the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Richmond Street and Adelaide Street cycle tracks. We have a series of speakers. Gerard Kolb from Cycle Toronto. Thank you very much for coming. You have five minutes. Uh, and uh, my name is Jared Kolb. I'm uh, executive director of Cycle Toronto, uh, Toronto's big member-supported cycling advocacy organization. Um, we are uh, here today, of course, to talk about the Richmond Adelaide uh, Cycle Track uh, report. Uh, within it are two recommendations, and we're going to provide some comments on both of those recommendations. Uh, first, the recommendation to make the Richmond Adelaide Simcoe Cycle Tracks permanent. 
I think there's a, a resounding level of support uh, for uh, the implementation uh, of making the cycle tracks permanent. Uh, for those of you who have, haven't had the chance to, to ride on the Richmond Adelaide Street cycle tracks, they've been a true game changer uh, for transportation options in the downtown core in the city of Toronto. Um, over the last several years, ridership has skyrocketed uh, in the western section to near, by nearly 1,200%. Uh, and cyclists now represent about one-third of traffic uh, on, mode share on Richmond and Adelaide during morning and afternoon peak times. It is truly incredible that Toronto's found a way to move more people uh, per lane of traffic uh, than, um, than previously, uh, and we've done it by bicycle. Uh, I think that this also is a testament, uh, an important note is that the majority of this growth has come from people who did not cycle before, uh, which again uh, speaks to the importance of protected cycling infrastructure. Um, I want to say a, a special thank you to Councillor Denzelman and Wong on this uh, for his leadership uh, in making uh, this project a reality, uh, you know, several years ago. Uh, and uh, there, of course, were many other folks involved in that, um, but this is, uh, this is truly changed cycling in the City of Toronto. The second recommendation in the report includes moving the Adelaide cycle tracks to the north side of the street. Uh, and I'm just going to show a, a, a photo of what we're talking about just to provide some of the context here. Um, Adelaide Street, uh, for those of you who, um, no, that's not going to work at all, is it? Oh my gosh. It's so dark. I can't see that. Um, what that photo is. Ooh, thanks technology. What, that, what this photo is demonstrating is that just east of York Street, the cycle track effectively disappears. Uh, and it disappears from York over to uh, just before Victoria Street. And so this is a, a fairly big gap uh, on, uh, within, with, on Adelaide in the, its current configuration. Uh, and it's, it, it, I think this is important. If, if any of you folks are, you know, uh, canoeists, uh, you know a portage route. Uh, and this is effectively what this serves as. Uh, this is a place where, for novice cyclists, uh, they're forced, and for, for confident cyclists, they're forced to merge uh, in a fairly chaotic traffic zone. Uh, and it has been reported as one of the big barriers for people uh, who, are, who want to travel, uh, may live in the downtown east side, uh, and want to use the Richmond Adelaide corridor. Um, but they find that that, is, uh, that barrier is too big to overcome uh, and is a part of the reason why we haven't seen the growth in ridership uh, on the east side of the project as on the west side. City staff are recommending moving it to the north side and while we're supportive of the proposed switch uh, in principle we've got questions about intersection design. Um, with a new design, it's essential that, you know, that we ensure that the permanent design provides a continuous safe corridor uh, for people biking and walking. Uh, there's potential for conflict given that there's no other con configuration like this in Toronto, a left side cycle track. Um, and I think our concerns primarily are at intersections uh, and that drivers who are making a left turn are not going to think to uh, or not expect cyclists to be coming up from their left. They're, they're accustomed to them coming along their right. Uh, for this reason, um, you know, in the report, city staff say that they'll consider um, a protected eastbound left turn phases uh, for motor vehicles at University, York and Jarvis. Uh, and from our perspective and from our review of best practices in the literature, feel that you know, those uh, protected turn phases for left turns should happen at all major intersections and quite frankly most minor intersections um, that are signalized. Um, so we see this as a key uh, recommendation um, from uh, our group in terms of uh, creating a truly safe corridor uh, on Adelaide. Um, we also see the importance of adding green bike boxes at every intersection to give cyclists a queuing area who are uh, making right turns. Uh, and from our perspective, we want to see a, a higher level of separation. And we're, we're grateful to city staff. They talk about uh, precast concrete curbs, and we'd like to see that across the entirety of the route. Um, that's all my time. Thanks so much, uh, and uh, look forward to making this project permanent. Great. Thank you for thank you to the deputant. Uh, any questions? No. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Rappasing. Thank you for coming. You have five minutes.
Thank you for having me, committee. Uh, I regularly use the Adelaide cycle track, and what I wanted to discuss with you today is the, uh, the, the motion to move it from the south side to the north side. Uh, so making it permanent is a no-brainer, as Jared has mentioned and you've seen in the report, but I don't know if it's clear that it's actually better to move from the south to the north for safety, traffic flow, et cetera. Um, the report highlights four different uh, pros of moving to the north side, providing a continuous cycle track, eliminating the requirement for cyclists to merge in the financial district, eliminating turning vehicle movement uh, conflicts in the financial district, and eliminating conflicts at bus stops. Um, but the report doesn't talk about um, for example, there are new conflict points that are introduced at intersections. It, it is more dangerous to be on the left side of the road than at the right side at intersections. You can see here in a diagram on the, on the, of the current configuration, at the top, uh, there is a single conflict point uh, in the current configuration. By moving the cycle track to the left, you've actually doubled the number of conflict points for everyone that's going along Adelaide. Not only that, on side streets, a similar phenomenon occurs. On the top, you can see a single conflict point is there but there are multiple on the bottom. And this is because just by moving it to the left side um, that you get this additional danger. There are other challenges. Um, cyclists don't know how to behave exactly in a left side cycle track. It's not clear what the etiquette should be. Um, do drivers expect a cyclist to merge from their left when uh, there's an obstacle or an obstruction in a cycle track? Uh, I went out with some people and we looked at how many cyclists turn left versus right at major at some intersections. Twice as many cyclists turn right as left at some of these intersections. Uh, how are all of them are going to be inconvenienced? Where are they going to be waiting? Uh, protecting against left turns, as has been discussed, there needs to be more signalization. Uh, New York has shown that uh, for many of their left side cycle tracks, they need to have uh, protected signal faces. We're only proposing three for some reason. And if you look at somewhere like John Street, which is not one of the ones that's being proposed, twice as many cars turn left there as turn right. Um, so there are very huge, there are huge volumes of cyclists, uh, of, of cars that are turning in front of cyclists uh, if we don't signalize the intersections. And lastly, transition areas, how are cyclists going to be switching sides from the left to the right? Um, has the extension of the cycling track across Eastern into the, uh, across the Dawn, how is that going to be coordinated? And looking at these pros, I don't actually think these are inherent to moving it to the north side. Most of these you can actually do by, uh, you can address on the current south side. For example, eliminating conflicts at bus stops, We've seen on the left, uh, on Sherburne, on Wellesley, and soon to be on Bloor, we can introduce bus stops uh, with physical protection that do not compromise this, uh, the cycle track and get rid of those, that conflict. In LA, on the right, they don't even wait till it's permanent. They can introduce temporary installations, which we could go out today and put in Richmond and Adelaide if we wanted to, to eliminate those conflicts. Um, number one and number two here, providing a continuous separated cycle track and eliminating the requirement for cyclists to merge into traffic. Uh, this is pretty easy, actually. Uh, for whatever reason, we've chosen to place a loading zone in the cycle track. And if our priority is to provide a continuous cycle track, all we have to do is take the loading zone and move it one lane over. We, we have chosen through the implementation to, to get rid of any of the, the, the protection in the south side. So we could do that today as well. And the last one is, uh, is on uh, mitigating turning movements uh, into the loading docks. Now, I, I agree this is, this is a concern, um, but the takeaway from this is that uh, the 300 trucks per day that are being mentioned is actually not very much. There are, there are thousands of vehicles that currently turn right across the cycle track without signals uh, that each individual vehicle, cars and trucks, represents a risk. And so 300 is not actually as big of a deal, but if, it's, if it is something you're worried about, once you've moved the, the, the truck queuing area outside of the cycle track, you could put in a signal for bikes and pedestrians if you really want to mitigate uh, that concern. And so my takeaway here is that uh, you know, moving to the north side mitigates one problematic area in the financial district, but it introduces a lot of challenges that are not fully discussed in this report. And these challenges require solutions to mitigate them that are also applicable to the existing south side. And so why should we move to the north side? Is, I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that. And so I think you should agree on making Richmond Adelaide permanent, that's very obvious, but I think you need a little bit more justification to, to move it to the north versus the south, uh, versus improving the south, which you could do starting today. Uh, and, and if you're curious for an example, this is something that you could do that would improve traffic flow, improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, that continues to use the south side uh, configuration. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, regarding... Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? No? Thank you very much. Chris Drew? Hi, Council. Uh, first of all, congrats on being re-elected or elected, and it's uh, great to see uh, all of you. So I live um, near Jarvis Street between Richmond and Adelaide, and I take the uh, Richmond and Adelaide cycle tracks very frequently. 
Uh, fully support the staff recommendation and thank you to staff for their detailed uh, review of the situation. Um, fully support the recommendation. Thanks to Jared from Cycle Toronto for always offering uh, constructive uh, points. Um, also, thank you to Councillor Denzel Milan-Wong for, as Jared mentioned a number of years ago, his uh, drive to put in Richmond and Adelaide. I think it's uh, been a big help. Um, one of the great things I just want to highlight in this report uh, is the is the TTC bus stops and how staff are going to look at improvements to the safety of those TTC bus stops. I think that will be great for not just cyclists and bus passengers, but great for the TTC drivers because often when they have to pull into that TTC bus stop, it's you know really stressful for them and adds to the stress of a bus pulling in and out of uh, a very busy corridor. So I'm very happy to see that happen and it works very well, uh, works very well in Sherburne. Um, I wasn't going to mention this, but the last speaker mentioned that uh, there were some, he, he looked at the pros of moving to the north side for Adelaide and basically eliminated them from his list and said, let's keep it on the south side and make improvements. I have to say, I, I, I don't support that. Uh, I think the staff recommendation should stand. He raised some interesting points, but it's my understanding and experience that there is a significant amount of loading on the south side and that staff have looked at this and they are recommending moving to the north side that will improve the experience for cyclist, cyclists. Obviously, intersections are a challenge. Intersections are always a challenge, but I, I trust the advice of staff, and I think that they've done a thorough look at this situation, and I would worry that changing the recommendation at this point and not making this permanent uh, would delay further implementation of the Richmond cycling, uh, Richmond Adelaide cycle track. So I respectfully agree to disagree with the previous speaker in terms of a last minute change at this point. And I hope that uh, this committee moves forward um, with the staff, uh, with the staff recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? He's running away, he must be afraid. Okay, uh, Miguel Pacheco. Hamish Wilson. Yes, good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. And I would uh, actually begin to comment uh, by uh, nice to have the environment included in this uh, committee. I would uh, like to have seen it as the Environment and Infrastructure Committee, just as I would have liked to have seen other committees as Environment and Planning, Environment and Executive. Uh, we are in a very perilous time in terms of the climate uh, breakdown. I think that's the phrase that we should be using now, not, uh, not global warming, not uh, uh, climate change. Uh, we've gotten too excessive. Uh, the momentum is too great, unfortunately. So I think we've passed tipping points. I don't know that this is always reflected in your agendas. If you really want to put environment into uh, the heart of what you're doing, and, and good, please, uh, let's start counting all the concrete that we use as a city. That's uncounted. Uh, so the, uh, it's nice to actually see this uh, on the agenda though, that's a good start and just let's also have an observation that uh, somebody was killed yesterday up on Lawrence. Uh, uh, sometimes we don't necessarily react well to the trucks uh, or don't take enough uh, caution. Can't always blame the driver, uh, but somebody's life was lost and there was a, a pedestrian killed as well. Uh, so with the, uh, uh, the Richmond Adelaide, yes, absolutely, it's a wonderful game changer. Uh, it's great to have such a long, direct route. If you build it, people absolutely uh, take advantage of it. And yes, Councillor Min and Wong does deserve some thanks for spearheading it. Uh, however, I'm not quite so celebratory in some ways because I've been around for too long. Uh, I guess with all of this, in the 1992 study, uh, which uh, was a, an offshoot or an outgrowth of the, uh, the Toronto target and the Changing Atmosphere Conference, uh, Richmond and Adelaide were looked at as, as possible options for, for east-west bike routes, along with Bloor Danforth, along with some other streets. Uh, so the Richmond-Adelaide pair was the number two uh, best option and Bloor Danforth was number one in 1992 and uh, we're still sort of waiting, aren't we, for Bloor Danforth. Uh, we've had some progress but as a consequence of that uh, uh, study, uh, at least uh, uh, going to the uh, 2001 bike plan, 
Uh, we had Richmond and Adelaide uh, uh, put into the 2001 bike plan, which is uh, what, six, to, um, I can't do math, but it's been a while since we've had Richmond Adelaide in the bike plan. So it's actually nice that we're making some progress on this. Um, uh, maybe not so much on bluer. There's all sorts of stuff that was undone. Uh, as, as part of the motion, uh, we, there was a unanimous motion to do stuff on uh, climate change in 2007, I think it was. We got to the quick start uh, options for uh, uh, the West End. Uh, cyclists have a real preference. Oh, if we could back off a little bit, uh, please, to show the fullness of this, uh, this image, please. Uh, thank you. Um, cyclists have a clear preference for uh, long, direct routes. Um, so that's part of why we've had this incredible upsurge, and it's also transit relief. That's a very important thing to be thinking of when you're thinking of approving this stuff, because far often we have a patchwork and a knot work, so we need to go long. So that's one of the issues that I think is, is, is yes, make this permanent, but where's the extension? That's all the extensions. That's almost what we should be getting at right now, especially with this transit relief aspect of things. Where is the plan to actually connect Richmond and Adelaide across that that uh, that uh, that roadway to Eastern Avenue? That's really important for East End transit relief. Yes, we have Gerard up there. Uh, I think it's Gerard. Yeah, but there's there's always gaps in the safety. So then we need the continuity, please. So I I like to push the envelope, obviously, but for for me, at this point in time, and the climate breakdown and everything, uh, and the great upsurge, that's what we need to be working on. Where is this sort of thing on our, uh, on our agenda? Similarly, out in the West End, let's have a, a dig through uh, under the, the rail tracks as part of that continuity. It's very hard to get the continuity uh, on the main streets with the streetcar tracks because they dictate lane uh, positions. And I'm sure some of you have seen this before, uh, the, the, main, uh, the main roads are where the cyclists actually want to travel. Uh, that's where we get hurt and sometimes killed. Uh, so it's absolutely good to have this continuity off-road, but come on, let's actually do things uh, for uh, cyclists for really a long time. The other aspect of it, if we are talking about transit relief, don't really uh, rebuild Adelaide quite so much because quite honestly with the relief line, which uh, is uh, we need relief function, no question about it, uh, I think uh, what's proposed is not right. The King uh, uh, was the target of the TTC's plan. Uh, Adelaide is very close, so time is up. Time is uh, up. Thank you. Approve this. <laughs> thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? No. We have uh, one more uh, late entry. Uh, Brody Johnson. Thank you for coming. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the late accommodation. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Brody Johnson. I'm the Planning and Advocacy Manager for the Toronto Financial District BIA. Um, just wanted to say a few words in terms of our ongoing consultation and collaboration with city staff on this project. So our organization has been involved with the Richmond Adelaide Cycle Tracks since their inception in 2014 and 2015. We've worked closely with staff uh, in terms of monitoring and un understanding the impacts uh, to our area. We fully support the relocation of the cycle track to the north side of the street. Uh, we have worked with staff over the past year to understand the challenges that the current configuration brings for the south side of the street. There are two very large commercial complexes on the south side, uh, which do have uh, very distinct loading challenges and operations that the, that the cycle track does present. So in terms of making the cycle tracks permanent, we do support the permanency of the cycle tracks and the relocation to the north side. And uh, we do understand fully as well that a monitoring commitment needs to be in place to ensure that impacts to the north side properties uh, with the relocation is in place uh, moving forward as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the deputant? Councillor Layton. I have one question on, um, on leading in intervals and intersections, because they've come up a couple of times here. And I know there's some recommendations to go through and review some of how the intersections work. Uh, where there might be some dedicated left turning signals. Is that something that the, the BIA is, is encouraging? Is it something that, that you'd be supportive of? Do you have a position about it? I mean, our position is I mean, really, if you're looking at safety of the cycle track and, and really for all users, whether it's pedestrians, vehicles, or, or, or cyclists, uh, the best way to prevent conflicts and collisions is honestly to, to separate them entirely. So having uh, stage signals is, is probably a good idea. 
Um, there are some designs with the, the left-hand turn lanes that I think needs to be addressed, given the two commercial properties that will be impacted, uh, and especially at uh, Young Street and York Street, those two intersections, uh, with the left turn lanes uh, becoming the north, north curb lane becoming a dedicated turn lane, uh, could back up in front of uh, some of those commercial loadings and the, the parking garages. But in terms of, of staging and signalized, I think whatever can be done to separate cyclists from motorists is probably a good idea. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Any other questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions for staff? Councillor Layton? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, just first off, how have the Adelaide and Richmond uh, cycle tracks performed so far? Uh, through the chair, the Richmond and Adelaide cycle tracks are the highest volume cycle tracks in the city. The performance since inception has been outstanding. Outstanding. Um, on table two, can, can you explain to us table two and what this thousand percent increase is? Through the chair, the Richmond and Adelaide corridors were quite inhospitable to pedestrians and cyclists prior to the dedication of space. So the cycling volumes on these corridors was very low before the introduction of the cycling facilities. Um, so the cycling facilities increased tenfold after phase one west of university and sevenfold after the installation of phase two. And the table three compares it to the, the decrease in volume on surrounding streets, Queen and King. Um, is it safe to say that we've probably actually increased cycling in the city as a result of these lanes? Yes, Councillor, that's correct. We've found that um, based on the counts on other streets, 94% of that growth that I described um, is, is as a result of new cyclists, not cyclists coming from adjacent corridors. Can we talk about collisions and safety before and after? Um, what did we see? Through the chair, almost across the board, we've seen safety improvements, both in perception of safety, um, as well as in the documented number of collisions. What's interesting about this project is because it's been several years in the making, we have several years of, of collision trend data to look at. Um, collision rates for cyclist collisions have decreased by 73% on Richmond and Adelaide. Uh, motor vehicle collisions um, involving, um, involving just motor vehicles have decreased by 18% as well. Um, and, and that is, is based on a rate of, based on the number of collisions per 1,000 average daily weekday motor vehicles. So it is, it does, is representative of the growth. Um, and in terms of pedestrian collisions, one section um, of, the, of the change has seen a decrease. That's on Richmond. I'm sorry, on Adelaide, we've seen a decrease in the number of pedestrian collisions. On, um, on Richmond, we have seen an increase that we plan to address through some modifications to signals. Thank you. Um, on table six, we talk about the, the movement of vehicles, of cars. And it strikes me that the, the small increase we've seen in the westbound motor vehicle is kind of offset with the eastbound. It's like the, the, the decrease in runtime from on Richmond is actually like it, if you if you leveled them off is probably saved with the changes on Adelaide. Is that a, a reasonable assessment? Uh, through the chair, given the amount of growth in the downtown core since 2013, you can expect that the, the volume of vehicles and the travel times would increase, especially given the amount of construction that's been on these corridors or in the vicinity of these corridors impacting the travel time. So we saw about a minute and a half increase in travel time on Richmond and about a 57 uh, second decrease in travel time on Adelaide as an average over that time period. Obviously there's been some spikes in increased time or decreased time depending on season or construction underway. Okay. Um, specifically to some of the, the, the comments that were made uh, about moving to the north side, um, you had a consultant prepare uh, an, an engine, you have an engineer's report that talks about the benefits of moving it to the north side. One of the points in particular was, and, and, and I remember having these conversations a couple months ago with you, um, is on if we put a dedicated lane for queuing for these elevators, these loading elevators. What, how did the engineer's report respond to that recommendation? 
Through the, the chair, we've, we've had quite a bit of concern over the course of the pilot about the truck loading elevators on the south side of Adelaide. And we've worked closely with, um, with other um, stakeholders, the FDBIA and Cycle Toronto, about design options to address the gap in the cycle tracks. These are major truck elevators that are capable of lifting an 18 wheel um, tractor trailer truck. And we're talking about about 400 trucks per day across of these two facilities. So they're very significant. They're, um, and they're, they're trucks that need to swing out, blocking other traffic before they come in. And while they're making those maneuvers, they block the, um, the cycle track, they block the sidewalk. They're quite chaotic in terms of the environment. The engineering review that we did with IBI looked at many different options um, for uh, realigning the cycle track to address um, this or realigning the loading zone. And we came to the conclusion that it would be best to move the cycle track to the north side with some caveats that we would need to consider protected motorists left turn phases at intersections to make sure those turn movements were separated for safety. So the engineer's report re recommended things like leading signals, dedicated turn signals, bike boxes that you're going to review. That's correct. That would be part of our detailed design That's, in the next phase. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Leiderson. Uh, just as an FYI, the uh, report in the agenda was uh, amended uh, slightly in the supplementary materials. Um, but they don't flag what was changed, so good luck. Any other, any other questions for, for staff? No, no other questions. So let's go to speakers. Uh, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I have a motion. I'm sorry, I didn't. The City Council direct the City, the ge uh, General Manager of Transportation Services to evaluate fully protected left turn phases <coughs> and right turn bike boxes at all signalized intersections on Adelaide Street between Bathurst and Parliament as part of the detailed design for permanent cycle track proposed to relocate to the north side of the Adelaide uh, Street and in doing so evaluate the safety and movement through the intersections for cyclings, pedestrians and drivers. Um, I'm doing this because um, in my conversations with members of the cycling community, uh, my own experience on the lane and with staff, uh, while, I'm, while staff assure me they will be looking at these intersections, it's not explicit in the recommendation that they look at all the intersections. In fact, the report um, suggests they look at a handful I agree that that handful is probably the first handful you should look at, um, but that it'll be important that we look at all signalized intersections as places where there will be uh, potential conflicts between, um, uh, between uh, various road users. Um, first off, I want to say how much of a pleasure it was working on, uh, uh, on, on this file now and six years ago when it was proposed by Councillor Min and Wong and in fact championed quite aggressively, and I can only imagine the conversations that were going on uh, back in the mayor's office of then Mayor Rob Ford and Councillor Min and Wong. And I gotta say, um, it was the first opportunity I had uh, to, to, to work with Councillor Min and Wong on anything. We don't see eye to eye on a regular basis. No. However, on this item, I gotta say, any t I would love nothing more than to have Councillor Min and Wong on my team if I was trying to accomplish a task, because his tenacity and his uh, focus on this particular issue where we saw eye to eye um, was second to none, to none. I was so pleased and, and honored to be on that uh, public works committee uh, that he chaired at the time, and I am equally as honored to be on this one that we'll get to approve to make it permanent. They've worked. We've seen enormous growth in cycling. We've seen increases in safety in, in, in all categories. We've actually seen uh, that, that, that the impact on travel times uh, has had a positive impact in some ways to other road, road users. Um, we're in a growing city. We've got to find different ways of getting people around. And this is one that many, many cities around the world are starting to focus more on. But we have heard time and time again, if you don't build safe infrastructure, people aren't going to start cycling. I've said it before, a, a story about my partner who, who feels often unsafe when she's out on the road on her bike, but by installing infrastructure like this, it gives her the level of confidence that not only she can cycle in, in the city of Toronto, but I can bring my kids out on the bike uh, in, in the city. 
that is a good positive step forward and let no one take that away from us and from uh, uh, Councillor Minnan Wong's leadership on, on the, these particular lanes. Uh, having said that, the change to the north side on Adelaide does raise some concerns about the, and, and they've been outlined here, I don't think I need to get into them in much detail, but they're typically around turning movements of cars and when the cycle track is in, is, is in place. This is something new. I didn't get to ask the question, but it is done elsewhere. And so we have something to learn from those other jurisdictions. They've looked at things like leading signals, like dedicated turn signals. In some cases, we'll want to give pedestrians and, and cyclists the priority to get through the intersection. In other cases, we actually may want to give that priority in advance to, to cars to get in and through that intersection, just to keep everyone moving through safely uh, and, and confidently. Um, so, but I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not going to direct staff to install all of those things at every intersection because I don't know which will work at what best. Staff have assured me they will be uh, undertaking a review and open to these things, but, but prioritizing what we are looking at and how we determine what to go forward with. And that should be safety above anything else and getting people moving through the core of our city in an efficient manner. So I've put this motion forward. I hope you'll consider supporting it. Um, and I'd like to thank staff. I'd like to thank um, the BIA in particular for being an open, uh, an open mind to this. Worked with a couple BIAs through some bike lanes. Some have very open minds, some maybe not so much. Um, but we, uh, through, through all of it, I think there's been uh, some support there and I think we've ended up with something better as a res result. I should say, Richmond and Adelaide have something that other cycle tracks don't have and that is, I think, generally with the support and money from the BIA that has made them quite beautiful and, and quite a pleasure to bike on in our city um, from an aesthetic point of view and I hope that that will continue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Any other speakers? Councillor Cole? I want to thank uh, all the uh, missionaries who have uh, been fighting for this, along with uh, missionary Min and Wong, uh, for uh, making this happen. Uh, obviously, uh, the old adage, uh, build it and they will ride. And so I think there's great opportunity here in the future for uh, the attraction of many new riders uh, who now don't have any choices. So this is going to be a real a boon to uh, people getting to and from A to B to Z, so I commend everybody who's done all this work and the work to be done ahead. And I just want to put on the agenda for the future, I just hope some of the missionaries, and I'm going to bring uh, Councillor Min and Wong up there for a ride or a, a walk, is onto the uh, K Gardner uh, Europe Beltline, which could be a great uh, sort of Adelaide uh, in the park, uh, an east-west uh, cycling route. There's only one missing gap and that is the Allen Road. Uh, there used to be a bridge across the Allen Road right there, connecting uh, the Upper Village uh, with Marleyville on the uh, west side. Uh, that is the York Belt Line, and then there's the K Gardner Belt Line. We could have an incredible east-west uh, trail uh, <coughs> built uh, right through the middle of Midtown but all we need to do is build a cycling and pedestrian bridge across the Allen Road, rebuild the bridge that was there. In the <laughs> but the bridge was there before. The, uh, the footings, uh, Councillor Peruzzo knows about this, the footings are there from the old bridge. So we just have to build on the old uh, footings and he can help on the construction. He's very capable in this area. So anyways, uh, thank you very much for all the work you've done. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Any other speakers? Yeah. Councillor Minner Wong. Well, I do want to point out that this was the first separated bike lane built in the downtown, supported by none other than Mayor Rob Ford, um, which is a remarkable thing. In the previous number of years, there was a lot of talk about separated bike lanes under the old administrations. They talked a lot, never delivered. It was Rob Ford's government that actually delivered the first separated bike lanes. And the reason why I support it is because it made sense. Uh, we were taking only 25% capacity one lane out of four, so that's going from, uh, you know, down from 100% to 75%, whereas in other circumstances, like a bluer, you're taking out 50% road capacity, which is, I think, substantially problematic. Um, even to that extent, I would, I, I mean, I'm very suspicious of their delay times for cars. Um, I suspect uh, the executive director also drives down that way from time to time, and if, 
a minute, 90 seconds. I suspect that there are often times that it takes a lot more than additional 90 seconds to get downtown to get to work because the delays are actually in the morning. If you're coming around 8 o'clock, are quite significant. So, oh, she's already here. She comes at 6 when it's like. <laughs> it's, it's, it's clear. No, no, it's just I'm calling it. I'm calling, uh, you know, it, it just it is what it is. I'm a little, I'm not really sure make, have, making them permanent cycle tracks. Um, I'm not sure that that's required or necessary. Um, you know, the, the expense involved will be significant and substantial. Um, I think we had a very uh, vigorous discussion of three or four years ago about putting those, um, the, pole, the flexi poles in, but they seem to, I mean, fit the bill. They're, you know, cheap and cheerful, but they actually do, I think they do accomplish what they need to accomplish, so I'm not really sure whether we have to like uh, spend all that money f for just to keep those cycle tracks going. They're working fine right now, so I'm not sure I'd be supportive of that. So anyway, um, permanent they are, and I'm happy to support that. Thank you, um, Councilman Wong. I think we have just the one motion. Uh, we'll put that on the floor. If we can put it on the screen, there it is. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. The item is amended. All those in favor? Court of vote. Court of vote. All those in favor. All those in favor of the item as amended. Councillor, Councillor Cole, Councillor Layton, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor um, Pasternak, right. Councillor Manen Wong. All those opposed. Councillor. I'm in favor. All in favor. So that's unanimous. All in favor. There we go. Um, I think we're done. All right. Anyway, thank you very much, councillors, committee members. Thank you very much, senior staff. Oh, I guess this question's for you. <laughs> he, wants, he, wants, he wants Google Maps on the screen. Okay. Yes, no, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to the clerk staff. Enjoy the rest of the day. We are adjourned.